Help me welcome Dr. William Grant in the role of vitamin D in the dentist's office, dental caries, periodontal disease, and systemic diseases. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, conference, which I'm finding very interesting. I guess I have a disclaimer to read. I do not have any financial interest in a product in my talk or in any companies offering grant monies for this continuing dental or medical education program. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the contribution of my uh, co uh, collaborator, Barbara Boucher. She's a doctor in, in London who's done a lot of work on, on metabolic diseases and vitamin D. I do have funding from several organizations, uh, uh, the UV Foundation, the Vitamin D Society of Canada, Sunlight Research Forum in, in um, the Netherlands, Biotech Pharmacal in Arkansas, and the Vitamin D Council in San Luis Obispo. So I'm going to discuss a little about periodontal disease, uh, then vitamin D, the mechanisms whereby vitamin D might reduce the risk of periodontal disease and dental caries, um, uh, some vitamin D and calcium supplementation studies, discuss vitamin D receptors, ethnic differences in periodontal disease, and then correlation between periodontal disease and other diseases and point out how the other diseases now are strongly linked to low uh, vitamin D levels. And then finally, where do you get your vitamin D? The, the purpose of doing this talk and, and um, writing the manuscript along with it is to point out to dentists that very likely periodontal disease is a strong marker, a strong indication of vitamin D deficiency and very likely underlies uh, the, the connection between periodontal disease and all the other systemic and infectious diseases. I have my own personal experience with periodontal disease in the early 70s. I spent two years in Berlin as a postdoc. I was in my laboratory all day in the bunker where Heisenberg had, had his um, uh, reactor. Um, I uh, didn't have any supplements. I didn't go to the beach. I came home, to, I went, went back to Palo Alto in 1973, and I had, um, uh, well, uh, periodontal disease to the point where I had to have my gums lowered. So um, I, I, know I, had period, uh, I know I had low vitamin D, I, I had periodontal disease, I think there was a very strong uh, connection. So you all know what periodontal disease is, uh, I don't have to go into that. Uh, the commonly accepted risk factors for periodontal disease include age, over the age of 40 generally, smoking, dietary factors, and lack of good dental care. However, these factors do not explain all the risk in number of studies such as the correlation of other diseases with periodontal disease. Now to turn a little bit to vitamin D. Vitamin D3, or cholecalciferol, is made by the action of ultraviolet B radiation on seven dehydrocholesterol in the skin, followed by a thermal process. Um, and the solar UVB extends from 290 to 315 nanometers, UVA from 315 to 400 nanometers. Unfortunately, sunscreen normally blocks the UVB, so wearing sunscreen uh, when you're in the sun prevents you from producing vitamin D. Now, once vitamin D is, gets delivered, it's converted to 25-hydroxyvitamin D. That's a circulating met met metabolite, and whenever you get a, a serum t blood test for vitamin D, that's what's measured. Then the 25-hydroxyvitamin D is converted in the kidneys and other organs to the hormonal version of vitamin D, 125-dihydroxyvitamin D, and um, that then does things as regulate the calcium levels in, in the blood, but it's also the part, uh, it, it affects the uh, gene expression, which I'll discuss a little bit later. Okay, that, that's because of the vitamin D receptors are acted, activated by 125. The vitamin D receptors come in different alleles with different effects. The half-life of 25 hydroxy vitamin D is around four to six weeks. So normally, uh, uh, serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels are highest at, in the end of summer, early part of fall, lowest in late winter, early spring. Um, vitamin D2, ergo calciferol, is made from yeast and is also found in mushrooms. It uh, appears to be much less effective than vitamin D3. However, it can be prescribed, uh, whereas vitamin D3 cannot. Uh, this is from Michael Hollick's uh, excellent review in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it, it essentially shows many of the effects of vitamin D. Back in 1997, when the Institute of Medicine had a, a committee uh, review the uh, dietary guidelines for vitamin D and calcium, the only disease they could point to at that time to base the guidelines on was rickets. And so when they set the guidelines of 200, 400, 600 IU per day, 
All they were talking about was reducing the risk of rickets. And the many, there have been many, many studies since then, the Women's Health Initiative, many other studies that use 400 IU per day in the treatment, in the, in the, in the study versus the placebo. They found no effect. Why? Because they weren't getting the, vitamin, the serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels high enough. There's a new committee uh, of 18 nutritionists uh, convened by the Institute of Medicine. They're reviewing the evidence that's accumulated in the last 13 years. They'll make new recommendations uh, May or June of this year. Okay, now for periodontal disease. There are um, cross-sectional studies. This is just, they've gone across the country um, and sampled a number of people, tens or 20,000 or so, measure a lot of the serum properties, their disease and so on. And then people come along later and, and process the data they find uh, they do correlation studies between some of the diseases found and some of the, um, uh, say, serum levels. So there's one um, that found that the 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels were inversely correlated with attachment loss in men and women, um, and it was a statistically uh, significant um, uh, finding. They did not find such an effect for people below the age of 50. They found that um, bone mass density uh, in the femoral region was not associated with attachment less, uh, loss and did not mediate the uh, association between 25 hydroxy vitamin D and attachment loss. So it's trying to say that for the, they've looked at some confounding factors and it's still, it was 25 hydroxy vitamin D that seemed to explain the finding. Now there's another study uh, by the same group um, uh, on gingival inflammation. Um, and again, they found a, um, a statistically significant effect. So if, there is an uh, association found. Do we have mechanisms that might explain why low vitamin D might be a risk factor for periodontal disease? I've identified at least three, and there are probably more. First of all, it's well known that vitamin D increases the absorption of calcium and the regulation of calcium metabolism. Second, vitamin D uh, has very strong antimicrobial properties, which I'll discuss in a minute. And thirdly, uh, there's a reduced concentration of, uh, it reduces concentration of matrix metalloprotein proteinases. So we know about the calcium. Um, and it, it, one of the things it does is tries to keep calcium out of the soft tissues, out of the um, arteries and veins, uh, and so on. Now, the antimicrobial pro actions is, is really exciting field these days. Um, the, the, the hormonal metabolite in vitamin D, 125 dihydroxy vitamin D, induces production of cathocidin and defensins, which have both antimicrobial and anti-endotoxin properties. These polypeptides have been found effective in fighting tuberculosis. 100 years ago, part of the treatment was a, 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 a um, heliotherapy, putting people in the sun or using a UV lamp. Well, that was producing vitamin D, which led to that, this to fight uh, the tuberculosis. Uh, pneumonia, 1918, uh, during our pandemic, those people living in New Orleans had much less case fatality rate from influenza than those living in, in Maryland because vitamin D was, was producing the uh, cathocidin and it was reducing the, uh, the um, uh, cytokines that were causing inflammation that disrupted the epithelial lining in the lungs. Uh, septicemia, sepsis, I've got several papers on why sepsis, both sepsis and sepsis, septicemia are, are infections related to low vitamin D that's for old people, that's for people with operations, that's for premature infants across the board. And oral, bac oral bacteria. Now, for viruses, we have Epstein-Barr virus, influenza, and rhinovirus. And just last week, there was a study published from Japan uh, showing that um, uh, in a randomized controlled trial of ch school children in Japan, those taking vitamin D had a much reduced risk of both type A influenza, not B, but just A, and asthma attacks. And asthma, we think, is caused by viral infections early in life, which then released on autoimmune disease, which then can be exacerbated by air pollution or, or, or other things. Now, the very interesting paper from um, the early th study from the 30s, uh, from the East, uh, and this is the paper can actually be found uh, through PubMed and downloaded. And what they did was they looked at uh, adolescents, boys, 12 to 14 years old, in four regions of the country. And they found that those living in the Northeast with less than um, 2,200 hours of sunlight per year had twice as many dental caries as those living in the West with over 3,000 hours of sunlight per year. Um, so we know that dental caries are caused by bacteria. 
We know they're caused by sugar. It's a sugar and the bacteria together, but it's the vitamin D can produce the defensins and cathelicidin that can fight the bacteria. So even though he didn't know what the effect, what the mechanism was, he had a very strong correlation between the amount of sunlight and dental caries. Then another study looking at uh, soldiers at the time of entry into World War I and World War II, three different studies, um, they looked at um, sort of a dental index with a low number being uh, good down in Texas, uh, New Mexico, and a high number being bad. And um, what I have on the right is a summertime ultraviolet B radiation doses for July 1992 measured uh, by a NASA satellite. And I used to be a NASA scientist, so when I got started in all these studies uh, back around year 2000, I knew where to go to get the data. So it turns out that there's a great asymmetry in the summertime UVB in the United States for two reasons. One is that the surface elevation in much of the west is higher than in the east. You've got the Rocky Mountains, you've got the high plains and so on. But the other factor is that you have westerly winds trying to cross the Rocky Mountains. And as they try to come across the Rocky Mountains, that pushes the tropopause higher and makes the stratospheric ozone layer thinner. So we have less ozone blocking the UV, um, UVB doses in the surface in the west than in the east. And so you see this asymmetrical pattern in the dental condition back in the um, 20s and 40s, or 10s and, and 40s. Uh, matrix metalloproteinases, um, uh, they assist in the modulation of interstitial tissue by digestion of a support matrix, especially collagen. And MMP9 in particular is known to be present in large amounts in active uh, 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 periodontal disease. Um, we've found that um, um, uh, vitamin D can suppress the uh, increase in MMP. So this appears to be one of the mechanisms. Now I mentioned the vitamin D receptors. Um, the 125 dihydroxy vitamin D has much of its action by binding to vitamin D receptors. It's sort of the key that, that, turn, that activates the lock. And then the, the vitamin D receptor, uh, um, it binds to, um, uh, to the chromosomes uh, along with the retinoid X receptor, and, and then it can active, it can affect gene transcription. Uh, it has maybe, uh, I have heard it was uh, 800 to 2,000 genes it can ex uh, control. Uh, in at least two thirds of the case, it, it turns on the gene, and maybe one third or so, it turns off the gene. Um, there are many vitamin D recept uh, re receptor poly polymorphisms. Um, and two of these have been studied uh, extensively in terms of poly, uh, poly, uh, periodontal disease, and um, a couple of them have been found to be correlated with the risk of, of the disease. There have been a couple of supplement studies. Um, this one used vitamin D and calcium. It found a, um, a beneficial effect for those using vitamin D and calcium, but did not separate out the calcium from the vitamin D, so it's you would think that vitamin D probably had a role to play, but it, it's not totally clear. In a second one, they looked at people, it was more of a, a cross-sectional study, those using vitamin D supplements and those not using vitamin D supplements, and again they found um, lower periodontal disease among the people taking a higher amount of supplements. Uh, there have been a number of studies on racial disparities between periodontal disease uh, expression, and quite often, African Americans or even dark-skinned people in Brazil have the higher rate of periodontal disease. Uh, in the United States, um, African Americans have a population mean uh, serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D level of 16 nanograms. Uh, white Americans have 26, Hispanic Americans 21. So the, um, the, the, uh, the difference in um, levels is co uh, correlates with, with uh, what you'd expect. Okay, then, in discussing causality in a biological system, A. Bradford Hill, 1965, laid down a number of um, criteria that you ought to examine. Um, uh, strength of association, consistent findings in different populations, biological gradient, preferably a linear dose-response relationship, plausibility or mechanisms, coherence in terms of natural history and biology, experiment such as randomized controlled trial, analogy with other agent and disease relationships, uh, and more recently, things like making sure you've accounted for confounding factors and, and uh, don't have bias in the studies. And from my perspective, now I'm a 
physicist, uh, atmospheric scientist. I've studied vitamin D for 10 years. Uh, don't study the mouth. Uh, that's, that's your job. But from, from my look at the data and the literature, it appears that periodontal disease has all the hallmarks of a vitamin D deficiency disease, or at least that's a contributor to periodontal disease. More work is needed. But if we assume that, where can we go from here? Well, as you well know, uh, and an earlier speaker today talked about the link between periodontal disease and diabetes and cardiovascular disease and so on. Uh, it's well known that there are links between people with periodontal disease often have other diseases and adverse uh, uh, birth of, uh, outcomes and so on. Um, one review I found uh, said that it has not been established that treating periodontal disease reduces the risk of any associated diseases. Um, so my hypothesis is that uh, some of the link between periodontal disease and both chronic and infectious diseases is low serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. Um, and if correct, this would mean that dentists in meeting with patients with periodontal disease would be one to tell them your periodontal disease may be linked to low vitamin D and if you raise your serum levels that will reduce your risk of many chronic diseases and infectious diseases. So uh, I think you have an important role to play uh, if all this holds together. Okay, so what is the evidence that vitamin D reduces the risk of, of um, many types of diseases? I'll go through it, but here's some of the ones I want to talk about. Cancer, we have about 18 types of cancer. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes type 1 and 2, respiratory infections, autoimmune diseases, falls and fractures. And the list, uh, Mark Sorensen, who wrote a book um, that I wrote the forward to, says there are over 100 diseases now linked to low vitamin D. And almost every week there's a new disease linked to low vitamin D. So here's the map of colon cancer mortality rates. It was the Cedric and Frank Garland, two brothers who in 1980 first hypothesized that sunlight through producing vitamin D reduced risk of colon cancer by looking at maps like this. And again, what you see, what I have overlaid here is the dotted lines are, are index of, of sunlight and you see the highest colon cancer rates are in the northeast, the lowest rates are in the southwest. And I've done numerous uh, ecological studies. Ecological studies, you, you look at population uh, average disease outcome, you look at uh, risk modifying factors average in the same population level, and you look at correlations. And I've included um, uh, smoking, I've included alcohol, I've included ethnic heritage, I've included poverty, urban rural residents, air pollution, uh, zinc and iron, uh, and still there's a very strong UVB uh, signal. In fact, even the International Agency for Research on Cancer has concluded that of all the cancers, the evidence for vitamin D is strongest for colon cancer, or colorectal cancer. So this is sort of a, a signature, a map signature of the effect of, of vitamin D, and it's very similar to what we saw earlier for, for dental outcome back in the 10s and 40s. Uh, breast cancer has a very similar pattern. It's probably the second strongest cancer linked to uh, low vitamin D. Of course, there are some hot spots over in California, over in San Francisco, for example. Uh, Marin County has been very concerned about their hot spot there for years. A study a couple years ago found that alcohol is one of the risk factors, and well, they're affluent. They live near the Napa, so of course they're going to drink a lot of wine. Um, okay, you can't, this unfortunately doesn't show. Um, we do have now dose-response relationships between uh, serum 25-hydroxy vitamin D levels and um, colorectal cancer. It turns out that uh, going to about 30 nanograms uh, of per milliliter of, of um, 25-hydroxy vitamin D reduces the risk of, of, of colorectal cancer by about 50% con compared to about 10 nanograms. And we have the same effect for, vitamin, for breast cancer. A little bit, it's a little bit slower. It's also nonlinear uh, because uh, vitamin D, you know, like anything, if you're thirsty, one glass of water is great, second glass of water is so-so, after a while you don't want any more water. The same with vitamin D. Uh, but this is a Mac and I have a PC, so it wasn't compatible. Uh, okay, now there is one randomized controlled trial for, for cancer that used enough vitamin D to see an effect. And that was done by Joan Lappe, uh, Bob Heaney, and colleagues at Creighton University of Nebraska. And they found that for 1,100 IU per day of vitamin D3 and 1,400 milligrams of calcium per day, they found a 77% reduction in all cancer incidence between the ends of the first and fourth years 
Uh, the serum levels rose from 28.7 to 38.4 nanograms per milliliter during that study. And here's the uh, placebo. Uh, this was uh, postmenopausal women, uh, average age around 65 or so at the start. So by the end of the fourth year, 6% uh, of those on placebo had developed cancer. On calcium, there was a 40% reduction. On calcium plus placebo, uh, plus vitamin D, there was a 77% reduction. So it appears that, that the vitamin D accounted for 35% of the reduction. And it turns out that vitamin D is very beneficial in reducing risk of many types of cancer. Um, uh, there have been studies, for example, of hard water in, in Taiwan. People with hard water always had less cancer than people with soft water, for example. Um, so here are the vitamin D sensitive cancers I've come up with. These have strong support in ecological studies. Some have support in observational studies. Um, uh, many of them um, are, are low frequency, so it's hard to do the, the uh, detailed study. Uh, Ed Giovannucci at Harvard actually did uh, studies on his health, uh, male health uh, pr uh, pr provider, health practitioners, and confirmed uh, six of these uh, statistically significant, another six not so statistically significant. Prostate cancer, very, very interesting one. There have been studies for years and years and years saying that vitamin D reduced risk of cancer. Well, it does not reduce the risk of getting can of prostate cancer. Uh, really, it turns out cholesterol and genetics and diet uh, are much more important risk. But if you get prostate cancer, then vitamin D is very beneficial in reducing the death from prostate cancer. So it's, it's um, um, you've got to keep that in mind. But anyway, here's the, the list of cancers, and, and um, it's quite extensive. Yeah, it includes lung cancer and melanoma. Uh, in terms of cardiovascular diseases, uh, the ecological study cannot show that UVB is linked to low risk of cardiovascular disease, but the observational studies can. Uh, starting with uh, studies in, in the Framingham study, the Harvard study, studies in Germany and Austria, um, the um, many studies would come out. Uh, there's um, it's a very strong effect. Again, it's it's sort of a nonlinear effect. Um, here's one study from. Um, uh, Austrians, I think it was a German uh, group that they worked on. Uh, we have, um, well, I've again done a <laughs> study, of, it's, you can barely see it there, but, but there is a, a dose response relationship. And there's a group in uh, Europe now that's doing the proper meta analysis. See, one observational study is good, two is better. When you have half a dozen studies, then you can do a meta analysis. In fact, uh, there's a paper by Parker, just came out uh, a couple months ago, where they just looked at all the studies on cardiovascular disease and diabetes and found that yes, if you just pool, if you just look at them and look at the highest versus the lowest serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D, there is about a 30 or 40 percent reduced risk of cardiovascular disease uh, for the higher versus lower uh, vitamin D. What we're trying to do is do the dose response uh, relationship. Uh, diabetes, uh, that too, uh, is a vitamin D uh, sensitive disease. And this is a Harvard, uh, I think this is Harvard or someplace northeast. I come from California, so from my point of view, <laughs> the northeast is hard near, or, or, or near Harvard. Um, what they found, it, it took calcium plus vitamin D to reduce the incidence of diabetes by one third. Uh, it probably has to do with something with the islets, the pancreatic islets and, and insulin production, probably something to do with insulin uh, sensitivity, uh, and maybe more the calcium, but the vitamin D helps uh, absorb the calcium and, and and put it where it belongs. Um, this is what I just mentioned here. Autoimmune diseases, uh, many autoimmune diseases follow in viral infections, especially early in life. Asthma, diabetes uh, mellitus type one, multiple sclerosis. Um, there are uh, additional mechanisms that, that uh, vitamin D regulates the cytokine uh, production shifting from the pro-inflammatory Th1 cytokines to the less inflammatory Th2 cytokines. Um, what I've shown here, which you can't see again, of course, is that in the United States, um, the, the prevalence of multiple sclerosis for veterans at entering World War II and the Korean conflict was a second order function of latitude. Now, we recall that, that uh, in the summertime, there's this very asymmetrical pattern, and the correlation with summertime UVB is not very good. 
correlation with winter time with UVB in my book is a winter time effect is showing that see then it's just a solar zenith angle or solar nadir angle um, and what's that showing is that uh, multiple sclerosis which is linked to Epstein Barr virus and to low vitamin D is probably in the winter when your vitamin D levels are low the Epstein Barr virus which is present in many people can then get out of hand and lead to infectious mononucleosis Hodgkin's lymphoma, and multiple sclerosis. Um, in fact, there was a recent paper from the CDC in which they looked at the prevalence of um, multiple sclerosis in three cities, and I graph their findings on the graph you can't see here, and it was displaced by six uh, cases per 100,000 per year, but had the same slope. And so here we are. We've known about the vitamin D um, uh, multiple sclerosis connection since the early 70s or 80s. I mean, it's really been strong since the late 80s, uh, late 90s. But still, there's no directive, no public health directive that get your vitamin D levels up to reduce your risk of, of multiple sclerosis. Uh, here's mortality rates. This is just one study out of many. This is uh, from Amsterdam. And what you can see here is that um, those um, starting with um, Less than 25, this less than 10 nanograms per milliliter is 2.5 nanomoles per, per nanogram. So those starting with less than 10 nanograms, half of them died within, I think, seven years, whereas only a quarter died if they had more than um, 30 nanograms per milliliter. And other studies like that have been found. This is uh, developed by Cedric Garland, um, uh, and, and it's on the grassrootshealth.net uh, website. And by the way, grassrootshealth.net is having a vitamin D seminar on April 9th in La Jolla. If anybody wants to spend a, a nice weekend in Southern California, uh, it'll be a nice day of many talks by Cedric Garland, and, and I'll be there with a poster. So I've done estimates uh, for various countries. Uh, I've done Western Europe, the Netherlands, Nordic countries, Canada, United States. And what I say is, okay, suppose we have the population mean value of 25 hydroxy vitamin D go up to uh, 42 nanograms or, or so per milliliter. And look at the dose response curves um, and, and estimate the uh, reduction in mortality rate we could achieve uh, across for, for vitamin D sensitive diseases. And see, often it's around a 25% reduction. In this case, uh, it appears that you could reduce out of about 2.4 million deaths, 400,000 per year are, can be considered premature due to low vitamin D. That's about 17% of all deaths in the United States. So that's why it's important if you find people with low vitamin D to get them to test their serum level uh, and then uh, supplement to increase it. Um, the serum levels uh, deficiency is certainly less than 10 nanograms. Um, uh, all African Americans, uh, almost all African Americans, are seriously deficient. I've estimated, is it, there's a paper that came out in the American Journal of Public Health um, uh, a couple months ago uh, by Orsi et al. They showed that the mortality rate, the ratio of mortality rate for African Americans versus white Americans was about 25% higher, 1.25 to 1, for many diseases. All the diseases were, were, were um, vitamin D uh, affected uh, uh, diseases. And just looking at the dose response curves for six, 26 versus 16 nanograms per milliliter, I could show that 25% difference in mortality rate correlated with the difference in serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels. And what's sad is that for years, the, the African community, American communities talked about discrimination, poverty, uh, mistreatment, uh, et cetera, et cetera, as a reason for their low, uh, for their high disease rate. They want to feel disadvantaged and, and picked upon. And I've been trying to tell the African American community, it's vitamin D, and it's very simple. $10 a year is all you need to get the vitamin D you need to increase your health. And uh, I think it's, it's been very hard to get through that community. Um, maybe because I'm an outsider, maybe because of Tuskegee, whatever. I'm still working on it. But it it's, seems like it's the easiest thing to do to improve the levels. So optimal level is 40 to 80 nanograms per milliliter. Um, uh, lifeguard in the uh, sun all, uh, all summer in Miami can get up to around 90 or 100, 100 or so. Uh, you don't start getting toxic levels for most people, and that's hypercalcemia until you're maybe above 150. But 100 is a good cutoff number. Uh, so the, the 
people who do have active TB, sarcoidosis, granulomas diseases, lymphoma, they have to worry about um, uh, getting, see the, the, the immune system is trying to put too much 125 hydroxy vitamin D into the serum, which is then gonna raise the serum levels, which is then gonna maybe lead to hypercalcemia. The, in 1997, when the Institute of Medicine Committee met, they found one study from India which talked about people with active TB, and at 3,800 IU per day, they developed hypercalcemia. So they cut that in two and said, okay, upper tolerable limit for anybody is 2,000. Well, that was a gross overkill, and I'm sure they will revise that uh, by this summer. Sources of vitamin D, 90% uh, of, of vitamin D comes from solar UVB. Uh, you've, uh, best to get it during solar noon with as much skin as exposed as possible. You don't want to turn red or pink. Um, if you start going out gradually every day in the spring, early summer, you'll develop a little bit of tanning and that can give a protection factor of two to four, meaning you stay in the sun two to four times longer. But of course you have to stay in the sun longer to make vitamin D because you're blocking some of the vitamin D uh, or UVB penetration. Supplements turn out to be the most efficient and the most effective way of raising 20, uh, vitamin D levels. For the average person uh, weighing maybe 150 pounds, uh, each 1,000 IU per day raises serum levels by about uh, 10 nanograms per milliliter. Um, so uh, you really want to take thousands, not just hundreds, but thousands of IU per day. Pregnant and nursing women should be taking 6,000 IU per day. And this has been shown in a randomized controlled trial by Bruce Hollis and uh, Carol Wagner. They reported last fall at a conference in, in uh, Belgium. They'll, they're, they're, they're working on a paper showing about the summer or fall but they had uh, 120 African American, 120 Hispanic, 120 white American women. They started with 400, 2,000, and 6,000 IU per day in different arms. They eventually abandoned the 400 and 2,000 IU per day because the nursing mother was not able to get her vitamin D levels high enough to get enough vitamin D to the infant to have the infant produce its own 25 hydroxy vitamin D to an adequate level. They found absolutely no hypercalcemia uh, on the 6,000 uh, uh, 6, IU per day. Uh, the birth dif the problems with, with low vitamin D in pregnancy uh, uh, include um, uh, primary cesarean section. In the United States, 9% of cesarean sections are primary. At least 40% of those are due to low vitamin D. The, pl the uterus is a muscle. Without vitamin D, it cannot be strong enough to expel the infant. And so, um, you know, that's part of the reason that, that pregnant women need the vitamin D. Uh, um, Preeclampsia, high blood pressure during pregnancy, that's also linked to uh, low vitamin D and low magnesium. Uh, bacterial vaginosis, uh, birth defects, there's there, a lot of birth defects um, occur in spring. That comes after a winter with low vitamin D. Uh, it's thought that things like schizophrenia and some other birth defects, maybe autism, uh, to some extent are linked to low vitamin D during pregnancy. Um, um, so and type 1 diabetes appears to also be linked to uh, low vitamin D during pregnancy. Um, my um, uh, artificial UVB sources that mimic the sun, they should have 3 to 5 percent UVB. Uh, they can be used as a source of vitamin D. Whole body exposure in a, a, a tanning bed, for example, can produce 10,000 IU in maybe three to five minutes. Now the older a person is, the longer it takes to make vitamin D. Uh, people over the age of 60 require four times as long uh, to make vitamin D as people under the age of 20. Of course, the darker the skin, the longer African Americans take five or six times as long, dark African Americans take five or six, six times as long as pale Northern European Americans. Uh, let's see, what else? Um, Mention that. Um, you want to urge your family and friends to learn about the importance of vitamin D, um, et cetera. Um, both grassrootshealth.net and um, the Vitamin D Council offer home testing kits for uh, serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D. It's through ZRT Labs in Oregon. They send you a little kit, you draw two drops of blood, you put it back on the card, you mail that in, it's mailed to ZRT in near Portland, Oregon. Within a couple of weeks, you have your, t your results. Uh, and they measure both D2 and D3. They have a mass spec, so they can separate out the two components. Um, and I've had mine measured several times, and I find it to be quite reliable and quite accurate. Uh, grassrootshealth.net also has a vitamin D scientist call to action. Uh, 
sign, these are the, uh, the, those of us who signed this, um, includes many of the, um, um, the best vitamin D researchers in the United States. Um, we're urging uh, that the standard intake be at least 2,000 IU per day and a serum level of 40 to 60 nanograms. I've actually met a doctor from o o O'Fallon, I think it is, um, um, Missouri, or Illinois, near St. Louis, Missouri. He has been routinely giving his patients, making them take five to 10,000 IU per day for the past three years. He says his, the patients used to come in four times a year before he started having them supplement. Now that the levels are up around 70 nanograms per milliliter, they come in once a year. And he invited me to go to New Orleans for a conference. It was the family physicians associated with the armed forces. And I got there through, got in late at night, only got five hours, five hours of sleep the first night, five hours the second night. By the second or third day, I, I had a sore throat. The next day, I had sniffles. Finally, on the fourth day, I noticed I had muscle ache. But on the third day, I took 50,000 IU vitamin D, and then started, on the fourth day, started taking a gram of vitamin D, a C every hour. And finally, Friday evening, I said, you know, I've got to rest. So I missed the river cruise. Finally, Saturday, I realized I had influenza. But I didn't, the symptom, it didn't get me down because I had the vitamin D to fight it and the vitamin C. Um, the whole thing about taking, um, well, I think that vitamin D is much better than, than, than the vaccine for swine flu. That's another story. Uh, but anyway, anyway, there's reasonable evidence, I would say, that reasonable evidence that low serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D level is a risk factor of periodontal disease. There is reasonable evidence that low serum level 25 hydroxy vitamin D levels explain some of the link between periodontal disease and systemic and infectious diseases. Dentists and allies could perform an important service to the patients if when they discover periodontal disease, uh, they inform the patient that low serum 25 hydroxy level, vitamin D level could be an important risk factor. Of course, um, more uh, studies would be useful. And here are some of the resources. I have my website, and um, there are some other uh, websites. Thank you.